Well, hello. Welcome into our midweek study. Glad you're able to be part of it. We're starting a new series this evening. I don't know exactly how many sessions it will last, but um, it is a new study. And uh, appreciate the good comments on uh, the last one we went through. But I want to start out uh, <clears throat> with, with a question. Did you know that the Bible contains the following command, which is, do not believe? The uh, Bible actually commands, do not believe. That might be surprising, um, since so much of the Bible is taken up with encouraging people to believe. Uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Um, I think of the passage in John chapter 20, closes John chapter 20, where it says um, Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded here, but these are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, so much of the Bible is encouraging belief, uh, but there is at least one place where the Bible says, do not believe, and it's a command. Where is that? Well, the place I'm thinking of is um, in the first letter of John in chapter 4. The key, of course, is to, uh, to ask, what does it mean? Don't believe, and that's that's the important part. So that's what we're going to um, be looking at. Um, now, Christianity is not for the lazy. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not for the lazy physically because we are um, we are taught to work hard in the kingdom, uh, and there is hard work to be done. Uh, it's not for the lazy mentally or intellectually because uh, we have to think. Uh, not everything that we're taught is easy to understand. Not everything is instantly understood. Um, and so you have to work as far as thinking. And so it's not for the lazy mentally. But it's also not... For the lazy spiritually. Um, and what I mean by that is there is this thing that we have to all do, um, which is to discern. We are called to be discerning. What does it mean to discern? It means to make uh, uh, distinguishing, uh, to, to distinguish between things, to separate things, to figure out if things are actually what they appear to be, or are people sometimes, if they're what they appear to be, um, we we must discern, and that's a spiritual thing we do. Um, and it's it's even one of the spiritual gifts that's talked talked about in the New Testament church. So we're we're talking here uh, as we look at First John four, in one sense about discernment. And we'll get into more of what that means. You see, just because somebody says this is true, or maybe they'll say it a different way. They'll say, God gave me this. You ever heard uh, a teacher say or a preacher say, God gave me this message or the spirit. The spirit laid this on my heart. Um, this is from the spirit of God. Well, just because somebody says that does not mean you must accept it. And I include myself in that. Uh, you, you should not just buy everything I say because maybe I'm your preacher or your friend or somebody you've trusted to this point. All I say needs to be checked out and discerned. Uh, one illustration of this from my life I'll never forget. 
I was a, a teenager, I was in high school, and uh, was up real late one night. I think I was watching a, a pro basketball game from the West Coast. It was uh, past midnight, up very late. The only one up, I, I was a night owl. I still am to some degree. But anyway, watching real late, the game went off, and before I went off to bed, I sort of flipped around the very few channels we had in those days. You know, we probably had six or seven channels, which seems amazing compared to what we have now. But I was flipping through the channels. Most of them were local, and I came across uh, a well-known television evangelist at the time that actually his home base was not very far from my hometown. So I grew up in Canton, Ohio, and his home base is up in Akron. There's a fellow named Ernest Angley. Some of you may know that name, others may not. Uh, but Angley was this uh, flamboyant uh, preacher with uh, a lot of strange habits, and he looked sort of strange. He had really bad fake hair and all kinds of things. And, uh, but he was... Uh, known for claiming to be able to heal people, among other things. And he would have these uh, sessions where he would preach, and then he would call people up to be healed of various things. And a lot of times he would shout at them. Sometimes he would smack them in the head, and they'd fall down and were supposedly healed. Well, every once in a while when that was on, and it was usually on in the middle of the night, I would watch for a little bit. Um, I don't know why I didn't buy it. I didn't believe it. Um, but it's sort of like for the same reason that, that I watched, uh, professional wrestling at the time. Uh, watch professional wrestling and it's one of those things that you know it's fake, but there is an entertainment value. So, uh, it was sort of like that for, for Angelie's services. And, uh, but the, the thing that happened this particular night that I was watching was that, um, I recognized one of the people that, that went up front at the altar call. In fact, it was somebody that I rode the bus with to school and he was a little bit older than me, maybe a couple of grades older and was always in trouble, getting in trouble on the bus. Uh, usually probably smoking something he shouldn't be smoking on the bus. Yes, that was the kind of school I went to. Uh, but generally a troublesome youth. I saw him go up and I saw Angley uh, uh, smack him in the head and he fell over. And and uh, <clears throat> I think Angley said something like he had cast uh, th this uh, demon that was causing this young fellow to do all these things to take drugs and so forth. He cast it out of him. And so that was very uh, interesting to me. And that was probably like a Friday night that I saw it, that that service was going on. And so I was interested to see what was going to be like on Monday when we got on the bus. And lo and behold, there was the same fellow on the bus as he always was, doing the exact same things that he had done uh, all along. Uh, whatever had happened at the uh, service service of Ernest Angley, it hadn't changed him a bit. Just sort of confirm, confirmed my suspicions that it was uh, it was all a bunch of baloney. We might say, and that's uh, as a friend of mine used to say, that's Greek for fiddlesticks. But anyhow, that's an example of something. Just because somebody says it claims it or says it's from God it doesn't mean you have to accept it. So let's go back before we get to first John four, let's go back to something our Lord said. Um, in, in his great sermon, the sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus said something that relates to this um, in verse 15 beginning. The Lord said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Now, that's very important, that part. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear 
bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So Jesus says very clearly, beware of false prophets. And, um, and then, of course, you recognize them by their fruits. Jesus uh, says something there that is really stated throughout the New Testament. Really, Old and New Testament, but we're sort of in the New Testament right now. It, this is a concern that Jesus and his disciples, his apostles, all had. And so we could quote many other New Testament writers. We could quote Peter. We could quote Paul. We could quote Jude. Um, and on and on we could go to show this concern they had about false teachers, false prophets, um, people who claimed things that weren't true. And they were constantly warning people about it. Um, one other place that we sort of see the idea reflected, I think, is uh, in, a, in a passage in Acts, in Acts chapter 17. And it actually comes from a, a place where there's a group being commended, all right? Um, Acts chapter 17, verse 10, maybe you remember this. It says, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So that's the really the only thing we know about the uh, the ones who came to believe in in Berea. Uh, they were uh, Jewish people. Uh, they were synagogue goers. And when the evangelists came, uh, when Paul and Silas came and taught there, um, taught them about Jesus and, and how to understand the scriptures, these were very uh, noble people in that they didn't just automatically accept what they said, but they checked it out in the scriptures Daily, they examined the scriptures to see if what was being said was was true. Not everybody did that. Uh, many, when they heard Paul and Silas speak, just rejected it because they were saying something different. All right? We don't want to do that either. Uh, but the Bereans were noble because they, they checked it out in scripture. We need to be able to do that. And that's part of being discerning in the way we're talking about it. So the question is, how do you do this? You know, um, and, and so is there a strategy? Is there uh, a process we can go through for evaluating teaching or teachers or, or claims that somebody makes to know whether they're really from God or not? Other than just our own opinion. Is there... Is there something, uh, an outline strategy, let's say, for evaluating, for, for discerning teaching that we hear? Well, there is. And there's probably, it's probably located in more than one place, but there's a really good one found in 1 John chapter 4. And that's what, what we're going to study. Um, now, how, how do we evaluate teaching or teachers or claims? All right. Do we just base it on how popular the teacher is? I mean, is, is this somebody that everybody seems to like? Uh, everybody lines up to hear this person. They draw great crowds. Uh, everybody buys their books, whatever it might be. Is that, is it the criterion of popularity? Is that how we evaluate? Or is it that um, the way they speak, the way they teach is something that pleases us? We like their style. We find them engaging. Um, they tickle our ears, however you want to express it. Uh, I mean, we're, we're humans and we have preferences. Some people we like, some people we don't. And we could sort of let that control whether we believe what they say or not. We might reject somebody that's teaching truth because we don't personally like them. That's no good. 
And we need to accept the truth regardless of the source. On the other hand, we could uncritically accept um, something from somebody that just really appealed to us. We liked them. Is that the criteria? Is it popularity? Is it whether we like them or not? Um, what about it, if it what they're saying just matches what we've always heard? Is that the criteria? This is what I've always heard on this topic. And, and so when, when this person says that I accept it, or do we go back and check? Do we, do we have some other filter to run it through? Uh, so that's what brings us to 1st John chapter 4. And starting this evening with, uh, verse 1, alright, of this, of this text. So John says, writes, beloved, do not believe. There's our surprising command. Do not believe. What does he say not to believe? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, that sounds very much like what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. Jesus said, you know, beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing. Uh, but John says, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Uh, what does this test mean? Test the spirits. Well, that's what we're going to see uh, in, in the following verses. So we'll talk more about that uh, later. But uh, he, he, he makes a statement that many false prophets have gone out. And, and John is writing you know, probably close to the end of the first century A.D., and already he's saying many false teachers, many false prophets have gone out into the world. I don't think that the situation has gotten any better. Uh, it's only gotten worse since the first century. We've had all these years for strange ideas to come up and for more and more false prophets to go out into the world. So uh, they needed to be discerning in the first century. We certainly need to be even more discerning 20 centuries later. And um, that can be a difficult thing, especially in a culture that tells us, uh, you know, don't judge anybody. Uh, and just, you, you want to sort of agree with everybody in one sense. Uh, but he, he says, there's all this false stuff out there. Don't believe everything. Don't believe every spirit, but test them to see whether they're really from God. And he's going to go on and give five uh, pretty clear tests in the following verses that can be applied um, to teaching teachers or claims that are made in the spiritual realm. And, uh, and they worked in the first century and, and, and they're still relevant today. Uh, let's just... Um, Read what he said and then reflect a little bit more on it for tonight. Again, beginning verse uh, one, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Then he goes on, he begins to give the tests. As we read through, maybe you can pick out some of them. Verse two, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, but and, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So you see there in uh, the end of verse 6, he's sort of indicating 
We're giving you a way to figure out what's truth and what's not. By this, uh, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Two more verses in this. Uh, verse 7, Now, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Familiar verses there. Uh, so again, I think there's at least five tests. Remember, he says test, uh, test the spirits to see whether they're from God. I think he gives at least five. And uh, these aren't five that I came up with. I mean, a lot of uh, students of scripture famous and otherwise have seen these through the centuries uh, in this text but he gives these five tests at least that are helpful in applying when we have a question in what i hear in, in what i hear in hearing is it true um this guy this girl that says that they got this message from god or they're doing these things they claim uh, by the power of the Spirit of God, uh, can I apply some tests to that to see if it's really true? And you can. And uh, one of the places those tests are found right here in this particular text. And we're going to look at those. But first, I think we need a really important warning. Uh, and the warning is that when we do when we do discernment, when we uh, do spiritual discernment, it always has to be done in the right spirit. Uh, we're talking about spiritual discernment, so we have to do it in the right spirit. We need to do it in love. We need to do it with kindness. Uh, notice how that text closed that we read. Beloved, let us love one another. Whoever does not love is not from God. So love has to be a part of this. And I, I offer this as a warning because discernment um, can uh, devolve into being always suspicious, being untrusting of anything that might sound a little different, and being unkind in our response to that. That's just as bad, you see, um, because you think about it, you know, let's go back to where we started. We started with the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, when he said, uh, beware of false prophets, okay? If you back up in that same chapter, Matthew 7, uh, where he warns of false prophets, how does Matthew chapter 7 begin? Well, another often quoted passage. It begins, judge not, that you may not be judged. Now that sometimes is quoted by a, a false prophet to say, uh, you can't criticize me. That's not legit, all right? But Jesus in the same place where he warns a false prophet says, judge not lest you be judged. And then he goes on to clarify, because he certainly doesn't mean never make a judgment on anything, because then what's the purpose of discernment? Uh, he goes on after he says, judge not that you, uh, that you be not judged. He says, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. All right. So in other words, the standards you apply, you've got to allow to be applied to you. Um, don't judge just so you can be uh a, uh, an authority or a judge on things. You got to understand that, that same kind of thing will be reflected back on you. That's why I said earlier, like for those of you who know me, um, I don't want you just uncritically accepting everything I say just because I say it. I can be wrong. I could go bad. Um, you have to evaluate by a higher standard than your opinion of me. All right. And then Jesus in another place, uh, in one of the other gospels in John, in John chapter seven, he said, judge with righteous judgment. So there's a good kind of judgment, righteous judgment that you can exercise. When he says judge not, he doesn't mean never ever 
under any circumstances uh, judge anything, no, because he says on another occasion, judge with righteous judgment. I think we'll find out by uh, studying these verses, verses 2 through 8 of 1 John 4, what righteous judgment looks like. So that's sort of where where we're going with this um, uh, this idea of of uh, don't believe every spirit. Um, how do we do that in, in practice? And and we'll give uh, really they're, they're practical suggestions, but they're they're the ones that John wrote down for us by inspiration um, in in the first century. That is. Uh, the introduction to this, we'll get into more of the specifics. I don't know how many of the, the five tests we'll be able to look at per week, uh, but we'll at least get into the first one next week. And so I hope you'll come, b- come back and be a part of that study and maybe reflect on this text uh, between now and then. If you have any questions, please send them to me so I can be uh, more specific in in what we go through. Again, glad uh, you're able to be a part of study tonight. Thank you for tuning in, uh, whether it's live or or by recording later, and hope you're in the midst of a great week. Let's pray together as we close. Holy Father, again, we, we, uh, we call on you, praising your name, uh, wanting to glorify you by the way we live and and uh, just thankful for the way you're taking care of us. Please bless each one that's a part of our study tonight. Give us insight into your holy words. Help us to understand them and to live them out. Thank you for Jesus who gives us every spiritual blessing and and for his sacrifice for us. Uh, It's such good news. Please show us who we can share it with uh, in the coming days. And please uh, take care of us until next time. Oh, thank you for hearing us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you all again soon.